Do do do. All right. Oh, I'm in your way. Oh no, you're good. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, since you're uh, over there in uh, Robin's Chinese. Next week we'll put right in some new eight. projectors and there'll be eight of these lighting up. Oh, 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 that's great. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Where are you going to put them at, though? Oh, yeah. We're going to replace these. Oh, these, I see them. There, there, there. Only we're going to go, these, these are five in the ring and one on the cap. Mm. We're going to go to five in the ring. Three on the cap, so oh. you can get the cap lit up like it's supposed to be. And yet, you know, like this one is showing over here, and it, that segment, oh. so you still got to line up something here, so there's one right below that one. So how do you get those aligned is my next question. Um, the I have to spend so two in the morning for the next year. I didn't want to have to trick this person on the east side of the house. It's sitting around the town of the town. Help you find something? No, I'm probably Okay. No problem. You're welcome to sit down if you like. I will. Okay. Well, I'm not lit up very well. Let's see. No, I'm hoping. I'm hoping on stage. See, now I'm lit up. Yeah, I'm hoping on stage it'll, it'll come out good. All right, we're getting people. We're going to try and get people. Okay, you yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, you're going to try. Um, so. um, this is mine, and I just have it right here to okay. try to get the. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um. <laughs> Are you okay? I mean, having it set up, I mean, um, just yeah, it's good right there. Them. Yeah, no, they could want that. Everybody's going to be sitting. okay. Okay, it's, okay. I was just making sure it was up and out of your way. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's actually, actually totally fine. So. Okay, thank yeah. you. All right, Rick. We're ready. It's, 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 it's 30. I'm here. <laughs> it was Oh, 
It's true. I don't mind ninety shilling, but today, good, but today definitely felt like a quarter day. Quarter day. We actually don't need to be here early tomorrow, so we'll probably okay, be here. Cool. if you need us for anything, we'll be here by five thirty ish ish. I'm good. But we're good. I'm good. Perfect. Um, you should probably shut that thing so people don't see the magic. All the pretty. All the all the PowerPoint slides that I'm showing. Good so luck with the showingness. There we go. Okay. Oh, it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, what's going on, man? Don't mind me. Oh, you know, getting ready. Perfect. <laughs> hey, could you, by the way, I've read your paper a couple times now. Which one? Uh, the one about the retention rates uh, for the um, season? Uh, the, the astrology way? students. Astrology students? Yeah, oh, sorry. Astrology students? <laughs> Dude, you know me. Yeah, my oh, head's on the clouds. Right. Um, was, was it for seasons or was it for it's probably for seasons? Yeah, I, I forget exactly, but yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great article. I can talk about it. What? I'd be happy to talk more about it. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's, I found it really interesting. I think the, the connection between being able to understand uh, geomet geometrical shapes and, mm -hmm. and 3D concepts. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it was cool. Yes, it was seasons. I'm sorry, I was I wasn't fully understanding. Yeah, yeah, the topic is Yes, yeah. okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have a follow up that's going to be published uh, in, um, I think beginning of December. I mean, that's when it, um, I mean the paper's pretty much done, but I can totally. send that to you too. I would love that. Are you um, thinking about ever doing a larger sample? Um. Not right now, just because uh, we don't have the resources. Yeah, and I'm we sure. Can't, it's um, just the way that things are set up right now, but it's um, there's definitely a lot of ways that you know research can go. Totally. Well, and I mean, you got pretty good results. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was that yeah. was fun. 
Yeah, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about um, the latest stuff too because it's even more interesting. Than, 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 than. One uh, thing I did notice that I kind of had a question about is I noticed the um, the third group um, had more classes than the other groups. Um, so what that does is that um, we have more numbers of students who took that. Um, oh, I misinterpreted. Yeah, so um, so it drives down the error bars for them. Gotcha. Word. Yeah. All right. All right. Hey, Aaron. Yes. I'm just going to get started. We don't need to make anything else. Is Rick and everybody in place? Already? Yeah, I, I think so. I saw his head um, poking out. Okay, so I'll go take a seat as well, okay. unless there's a reason for me to be here. Yeah, I, okay. I think. Good evening. I'm Michael Schrauss. I'm uh, an employee of Bent the St. Grain Company, one of the traders. And I don't recognize any of you folks, so I'm guessing you must be travelers just arrived off the Santa Fe Trail. So you're pretty green out west, is that right? Well, welcome to Bent Sport. I'm in the process of preparing to do a trade with an Indian. We have a Lakota uh, band that is still camp outside, and the leader is going to come in. His name is Night Chief, and we're going to trade for some buffalo robes. So, if you need supplies, if you need food, if your wagons need fixing up, our blacksmith is perfectly capable of taking care of that stuff, but we'll have to take care of it after we get done with the trade. Now, if you've never seen an Indian trade before, there's certain procedures, certain processes that you have to do. First of all, I have to establish that I'm a friend, that I'm a brother. If I don't do this, we're not going to be very successful in trading. And in establishing that I'm a brother, brothers share things. So what I've got here, I can't. we can't go right into selling the goods. I've got to establish that I'm a brother. And the way I do that is I will give him gifts. Um, sufficient gifts that he can turn around and then give every member of his band according to their stature. This this improves his status because he's given out these gifts. It improves my status because I gave him gifts to give to his band. And of course, everybody in his band knows that, knows that the gifts came from me originally. So it improves my status that way. So everybody wants to trade with me because 
I've given these, these gifts to establish my friendship. And once we've established that we're friends, we'll smoke the pipe, share coffee, and then we'll get into degree for the good. Wow. Um, you may have heard green sheep the Indians. This is a common misperception. <clears throat> Even as early as the 1820s, um, I'm going to relate a story that takes place in uh, uh, Fort Winnebago, Wisconsin territory. The Indian agent back there was throwing a dinner party, and at the party was a French trader named Sue Rollet. He's approached by a woman during this party, and she says to him, Monsieur Rollet, I would not be involved in the Indian trade. It seems like such a system for cheating the poor Indians. To which Monsieur Rollet replied, Madame, I have been involved in the Indian trade for 20 years, and I have not yet succeeded in cheating an Indian. The Indians, they're not naive. They are sophisticated, knowledgeable consumers. They know quality, and they know what things are worth. Not only does he know what he, should, he, he expects to get from me, he knows the prices that are being charged at Nine Pastor Lupton's up on the South Platte. He knows what they're getting for goods at Fort Laramie, the American Fur Company up there on the Laramie River. And if my prices are out of line, he's going to point it out. I can go to Lancaster Lupton's and get better prices. So he's going to keep me in line. I'm not going to cheat him, at least not very much. So I need to get a few things ready here. And we'll be ready to start. Friend. He does not speak English. We're going to do this in sign language. Buffalo. He smokes the pipe, points to the earth, points to the sky, points to the west. To the east, to the south. Is the pipe to me to smoke? I have some coffee here. Muddy water is the often part of the ritual. Trade. Trade meaning. Much. 
So seven buffalo for one more. Seven buffalo for one more. Right there. Five. Seven Ten good. Yes. So we did the best. Three and a half point one. So it's a big one. It was a smaller blank in the beat. It feels like this is a big blank. I can't sell it. Two. 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 Thank you. 
What we're doing is we are establishing prices for the whole thing. Just deal with it. These are prices that are going to be accessible. Many rivals can trade in just this way. Thank you very much to Michael and Mike Chief, who are two volunteers down at Bentsville Fort National Historic Site in Atlanta, who are from the Denver area, who came up to help us this evening. So thanks again, you guys. Great. And believe it or not, what you just saw is a pretty short version of trade. Uh, the trade that went on with the tribes, between the Bents and the tribes, uh, often took hours and hours and hours, if not days, to work out the trades. So uh, you just got a brief taste of what it was like. So um, we are going to uh, uh, show you a little more of Ben's Fort now. Uh, we have a few um, videos that we shot um, <coughs> that were uh, done in this virtual reality dome footage. Here's John Carson, one of the employees of Ben Sport, riding a horse into the middle of the plaza. So you might ride into the fort, and you might need to uh, have uh, 
oh, maybe some uh, new horseshoes put on your horse. And so you could get that done in the blacksmith shop at Ben Sold Ford. The blacksmith was a really busy guy before. Making a lot of items for the trade, uh, wagon parts for all the Ben St. Green wagons, oxen shoes, horseshoes. So uh, we had a uh, working forge and blacksmiths that work at the fort. We see one at work here. I think he's just making a little test one. That big thing he's pumping on with those are bellows. Air flows through that buffalo hide pipe right into the fireplace, the forge. Forge off the steel and some of the items the blacksmith made might actually be traded right out of the trade room into the fort to somebody who comes in to bring in their furs to trade. I definitely fancy I'd be needing some more than that's DJ, our fourth cat. He wanted to make it appear as. Let's see what else. Yeah, let's see. I'm going up. Give me some beans up. And once you've traded in your furs at the fort, one of the last things we did at the fort was we pressed those furs down in the fur press in the middle of the plaza. Buffalo big bulky things, we press them down into real tight packages to throw them in the wagon to ship them back east. So these two gentlemen are operating the fur press in the middle of the plaza at the fort. All right, so we can go to the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, my name's Rick Walder. I am the uh, Chief of Interpretation for the National Park Service at Ben's Old Fort National Historic Site. And uh, some of you will be joining us down there later this week. Uh, we're about uh, three hours or so southeast of here, outside of La Junta, Colorado. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, immersive education uh, project that we've been working on at the fort. Uh, with uh, Aaron Walsh, the Merchant Education uh, Initiative, and with uh, Otero Junior College and Wilmington High School. So starting out with the fort, you uh, were just sitting in the plaza there. The, the fort itself was originally constructed in 1833. Uh, the three partners who built the fort are there at the bottom. Uh, starting over there on the left, Charles Bent, Saran St. Brain in the middle, and William Bent over here on the right. Uh, the fort was not a military post. It was a trading post. It was built to make money. As you saw in the uh, vignette here, that's what the place was about. Uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't built to fight anybody. Think of it more like a big Walmart. Uh, it was there to make money. And uh, unlike Walmart, you could come in and actually barter with the traders to uh, get a good price. So, uh, the fort operated for 16 years there and uh, was kind of the first American presence in this part of the world, brought uh, American business out to the Southwest. This is what the fort looked like when it became a national park. It became a national park in 1960 and uh, all that was left of the original Adobe Post was just kind of a mound of dirt and uh, the National Park Service did excavations to uh, find all the foundations of the post uh, in preparation to rebuild the fort. And very uh, helpful in that reconstruction, the rebuilding of the fort, were some drawings that were done uh, by a man who visited the fort twice, 1845 and 1846, Lieutenant James W. Bear. And uh, these are a few of his sketches. Uh, the one up there at the top right uh, it actually has measurements on it, and that was actually used uh, by the students too when they were reconstructing the uh, the fort in Minecraft. 
So here's the Park Service, uh, National Park Service reconstruction of the board. It was done 40 years ago, 1975, 1976. The National Park Service rebuilt the post right on top of the original foundation. So this is right, it's right exactly where it used to be. And as near as we can get it to what it looked like. So 40 years after that reconstruction, we've had another reconstruction. We've had a reconstruction by students at Lahana High School and Otero Junior College in the video game Minecraft. So you see the Minecraft view on the right there. Uh, today at the fort on field trips, school field trips, we get about 4,500 school students that come visit the fort every year. Um, tomorrow, millions, because we'll have that virtual fort out there and students from all over the world can come visit Ben's fort. This uh, year, this month, and in fact this week, are very important for the National Park Service because it's our 100th anniversary. Uh, Thursday, uh, August 25th, will be the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. We were established on August 25th, 1916. So in celebrating our centennial, our director, John Jarvis, has really made it a point that we must find a way to connect to the next generation. And in fact, the National Park Service uh, is trying to do that uh, in one way, is certainly through virtual reality. It is a way to, to learn history. Uh, you have games that are historically based. Uh, the one down in the, in the left-hand corner is one from Williamsburg, an interactive uh, uh, game that Williamsburg has developed to put online. Uh, and uh, this is where we're headed with Men's Sport. The Park Service for its 100th anniversary has put out what it calls a call to action. And it's steps to engage uh, the next generation of park visitors. And this project fits in just perfectly with a lot of those steps. Uh, here we talk about creating connections between a younger generation and the parks through diverse park experiences, working with education partners, youth organizations. And it talks about a progression of experiences from education programs to internships, volunteer opportunities to employment. And that again is one of the things that this whole project with Otero Junior College, with Immersive Ed is, uh, is giving the students at the high school in Mahante and at Otero Junior College good skills that they can use in the future, whether it's working for somebody like the Park Service or working somebody like Disney or working for a video game company or any other ways that virtually reality will be used in the future. We also want to provide multiple ways for children to learn. Uh, virtual field trips, so that will be something we'll have. Online resources, educational partnerships. So again, fits into what the Park Service is trying to do. Reaching new audiences. We want to transform digital experience, have interactive, up-to-date content from every park and program. So another way our program, our project fits right into this. And finally, we got engaged with interpretive media that offer interactive experiences, innovative, immersive, fully accessible and learner-centered experiences. So all things that uh, this project uh, is working on. And you'll hear more about that sort of stuff from uh, Aaron and Megan here in just a minute. So what we have is the uh, uh, virtual bed sport built in Minecraft uh, over the years 2015, 2016. Uh, the students there constructed uh, uh, the fort, and we'll have the virtual ribbon cutting on Thursday uh, down in Lahunta at Otero Junior College. And we've also had the opportunity to share this uh, around the world already. In May, we had a cultural exchange with a group in Melbourne, Australia, a group of kids down there. And we, uh, the, the kids here from uh, Lahunta High School, uh, sort of toured those kids around the virtual fort. And we also have them now working on the fort, too. Uh, I said the pictures of all the rooms of the fort, and they have been working on the uh, furnishings, tables, chairs, shelves, counters, things like that, to go around in the fort. So we have got uh, this group in Australia uh, involved in working on the fort as well. And then we have the virtual reality filming, which we also did in May, the, uh, some of the fruits of which you just saw, the uh, videos that you saw, and uh, the nice wraparound picture of the plaza that uh, Kachun took. Um, to bring uh, uh, the fort into a dome environment. So it's been a great successful partnership between University of Education, the Junior College, the Park Service, and, and Lahana School District, and Lahana High School, and we're very happy with the way it's turned out. 
I'm going to turn it over here to uh, Aaron Walsh and let him talk about uh, the immersive ed side of the partnership, and then we'll have Megan talk about Ontario Junior College after that. So turn it over to Aaron. Thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for the vignette. Um, my name is Aaron Walsh. We're going to queue up my slides in just a moment, but thanks for taking the evening here uh, with us. As Rick mentioned, uh, the fort is being reconstructed virtually. It's one of uh, several immersive education projects that are dedicated to arts and culture. And the reason that we're doing this, uh, sort of my background, here we go. Uh, we can go ahead and I'll start clicking. There's the old obligatory background slide. Um, we began this project almost two years ago, and you're starting to see some of the fruits of that labor. It's a fairly large and involved project. Uh, of course, the National Park Service, the city of La Junta, uh, Otero Junior College, East Otero School, and that's the uh, high school, middle school in La Junta where we'll be going. And as Rick had mentioned, the Australia Immersive Ed Club, and finally the Boston College High School Club. We had two students there, including one who I know personally, my son, who started to finish it all up so that we can do the ribbon cutting. Um, so it's a, it a big project, and it's what you're seeing, or starting to see, is the very beginning of the results of that. I uh, would also like to think that tonight was possible in the, in the presentations that you'll see coming up in large part to uh, immerse a sponsor of the event and also a collaborator who focused and specialized in dome, sort of planetarium maybe another word, but we call them the dome primarily, dome-based uh, entertainment, research, and media. So with great thanks to Immersa uh, for organizing this. And that came by way of a local committee here in Denver that worked uh, for almost eight months, I think, we were working on this. So that is the individuals here, Kachun, Dan, Ethan, Ben, and David, that made this uh, night possible. So thank you personally to them. But yeah, a clock wouldn't hurt, because we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be here without them. Uh, we're on night one of our four-day journey, and some of us will be going down into uh, the valley, La Junta, either by uh, riding on the bus or driving, and we'll start at that point you really see the fort and you will have virtual reality headsets i'll show you how to use those and you can actually start to see everything you saw on the dome virtually in those headsets that you have so at the end of the night i'll, I'll give you a sneak peek on how to use them uh, but the lahunta sessions were organized by uh, the bents for immersive bents for committee and there's a familiar name up there tim walsh that's my father who's around here in the back somewhere there you go uh, this is a really personal project because my background is from uh, Colorado, I'm from La Junta. Uh, I'll go on and talk about immersive education, which is worldwide, but I was simply here a couple years ago for Father's Day. We went out to the fort, we went to Bogsville, came back to the fort, and I'm sitting here inside the fort thinking, we're doing this all over, why are we doing this in my home? So my father took the lead and he contacted Jim Rizzuto, uh, the president of the local college, Otero Junior College, touched base with Rick and Alexa, the National Park Service, and we put together a committee and began to deliberately pursue recreating Ben's Fort virtually uh, for a number of reasons. One, we want to bring the fort to people who can't get there. We also want to give people a chance to come back after they've been there. And so you're starting to see the very beginnings of that. Uh, Megan will speak in a moment, and we have the rest of the committee that made uh, the La Junta sessions and immersive Ben's Fort possible. So at this point, enough with the dry slides. You came here for something more than PowerPoint. We could do this uh, until the cows come home. But why don't we cut on over uh, to the videos, and I'll talk a little bit more, show you some examples of what immersive education is. And it'll give you a sense of the wide range of technologies, uh, one of which we're using here, the dome. And in a moment, maybe at the break, if you haven't already tried the virtual reality headsets, uh, you can give those a shot. All right, so we'll just kind of move on through the sequence here. And immersive education was be, it began back in Boston in 2005, and the intention there was to bring immersive technologies uh, into education, to engage students with a variety of these technologies, and to give them a, an either better learning experience or an augmented learning experience using high technology. Uh, in the past 10 years, the organization has grown considerably. It's international. 
uh, from home schools all the way up through uh, major universities and government agencies. It's a suite of technologies I'm going to show you. Uh, primarily people are interested in virtual reality. That's real hot right now. But virtual worlds, learning games, simulation, something we call FAM, being able to walk into a room and experience it virtually. Uh, and also 3D printing, being able to take these virtual objects and turn them into real physical objects that students can handle and interact with. You'll see some of that in Lana. So the question that I, I get asked most is, you know, what is immersion? You know, what is the intention here? And the intention was simply to kind of recreate this experience that I had in Boston, coming from La Hunt to Colorado. I had read about the Boston Tea Party. I read about Paul Revere's ride, but it was all in textbooks of black and white. And it didn't interest me. I did it because I had to. Um, but when I got to Boston, I was like, oh my god, <laughs> this is the real deal. We're on the boats, we're on the trail, it's Paul Revere's house. And it really struck me that I was immersed in the physical reality here, and I had no way to share it with family back home or friends. Uh, at that point, I got deeply involved with virtual reality. I thought, here's an opportunity to share the experiences. That's all it began with, share the experiences I'm having with my family and friends. I was working at Boston College at the time, and as the development of the technology progressed, it became very clear that it was a way to give students a sense of being there, being present in the moment. And the sense of being there with virtual reality can actually lead to an authentic learning experience that you believe, your brain believes, happens. So I'm going to show you some examples of what being there in virtual reality means. So here we are. We're here physically. So he's here virtually, his brain is telling him he's there. He'll remember that as an authentic learning experience. He believes it and he'll have memories of being there, not playing a game, but I did this and that. Here's a full body immersion, it's called a corner cave. We built one of these in South Park in Pueblo for the students. In this case, the corner cave is being used for city construction, building and creating the cities. Here he is actually laying out the grid of the city, city design. And here we have the same technology used for vocational ed. In this case, it's a caterpillar tracker. They have to go in find the problem with the part, repair it, and then test the vehicle, the tractor, to see that it actually operates properly. Again, it's using cave technology, where you step into it and you're surrounded. If you see they have special glasses, this is in full three dimensions for them. It's not a flat wall. They believe that there is a tractor in that room, and they step into it. We're going to repair it, and in a moment, he'll step on in. There we go. And we can actually hit the, the right arrow. We can jump over to the next sequence. Thank you. All right. So these were test subject one and two, who you'll maybe meet tonight or over the next couple of days. Those are my children. And uh, we were working with virtual reality in the early days when they were still very young. And uh, about a decade ago, immersive education brought 
this technology over from uh, Singapore, a research lab there. And there, I'm in my living room playing with it. And what you see here is a mixed reality. My living room, and me off screen, twisting this little card. And the card is called a marker. It looks a little bit like a QR code, if you're familiar with those. And there's my son, Liam. I just said, check this out. And I sat him down in the chair. He put the cards in his hand. He starts doing what's called spontaneous uh, learning. He's questioning things. He starts, one of the first questions he asked is, why, if this is the earth, why isn't it round? I said, well, it's the gravity field. Mountains, oceans, different types of um, deposits make for a, a non-round gravity field. Then he starts putting them together. How does a rocket land here? And it's that kind of spontaneous learning that happens in these immersive environments that are properly constructed. This was just a prototype. Those images that you see, there's a frog in one hand. This came from a Japanese pond uh, over in Singapore. We were just playing around with it. Here are some of the early examples again. On the left-hand side, these were what are called whiz cubes. Uh, they're using symbols, and this is coming from Singapore, so they, they won't precisely match what we expect. But the student is basically looking for the virus that affects the proper organism. And what they're doing is flipping those cubes over, looking for the right organism, looking for the right virus. And when the student thinks that there's a proper match, they will click the cubes together. And if they did it properly, the virus will infect the host. And they got it right. The fish is swimming, and then it starts to become paralyzed in a moment. So the quiz, that was a quiz, he passed. In the lower right-hand side, you see different applications of the same basic technology. Again, this is mixed reality. And if you're going to be doing any of the Pokemon Go with us, that is a similar technology, often called automatic or pardon me, augmented reality. So these are really old examples of augmented and mixed reality. In a moment, you're going to see some very modern examples. And we'll play Pokemon Go. If you're interested, you can join us. Uh, that is a current example. The world's most popular augmented reality is currently Pokemon Go. If you turn the augmented reality option on. Ouch! All right, sorry for the ears. These are all examples of holding a phone or an iPad up and seeing something virtual combined with the real world behind it. It's essentially an invisible hidden world that your phone or your tablet unlocks. That's my favorite, the creepy baby. So some examples of, of modern augmented or slash virtual reality. Okay, so in this example, what we have is called a virtual world. So we've seen virtual reality, augmented reality, and now a virtual world. It could be used in virtual reality with a headset, but it, in this case, it's used on the flat screen. And we were asked by cell parking in Pueblo to bring their students places that they couldn't afford to go, including the local zoo. That was quite astonishing. They had buses, but no gas, no, no funds for gas, no funds for the driver. They asked us if we could, in fact, create something or bring them to a zoo or aquarium, and we could certainly do that. 
and what the kids were doing was just playing. Let's quickly choose our personal goal. So another example. We have a couple to choose from. So in this example, what we see is a virtual world for a totally different usage. This is a virtual world to get students with autism comfortable with interacting with other people, helping them to read the facial cues, helping them to interact. They walk into this virtual world, they have a virtual character. Psychologically, that virtual character goes through a process of projection where they feel as if they're that character. It's very powerful. If your virtual character loses weight, you're more apt to lose weight or gain it. In this case, the students have a virtual character and they become comfortable interacting. So children with autism who often have difficulties are practicing in virtual worlds. And here's an example of the same technology used for the Children's Museum in Boston. Uh, we created this as a way, similar to Ben's Fort, to give visitors a chance to return to the Japanese house. This is a small Japanese house that is pretty delicate. Give visitors a chance to return and also to bring people there who have never been there before. This is one of my favorite uses of virtual worlds. It's, it's a time lapse, but we have students in an architecture program who have created the blueprint, digital blueprint, they lie it down. Then they have to construct. And Every student is accountable for a different piece, and the instructor can see who built what. There's really no way to cheat. Your, your avatar, your character, is tied to everything you built. So you have an inventory of what you created and when. And maybe we can turn the audio up on this and let, just let Harvard graduate students talk about what they've been doing in their program. Um, I think we got the, it's interesting, when we're, first time we're in a dome, we got the music but not the audio track. I can talk to it. It's basically a, a virtual world for ecosystems, where the students have to go into an ecosystem, they measure turbidity, they measure uh, alkalines and acids, they measure temperature, uh, they check in on the species, and they're basically doing field reports. and something ends up happening to the fish. The fish all die. And that's the aha moment of what happened here. The kids are just kind of going through and doing lab work or field work. And then they come back one day and all the fish are dead. Now they have a real incentive to continue digging into the ecosystem. What happened here to kill these fish? And as it turns out, the, the Manny, the person we just saw with the fertilizer, he had fertilized too much and it had run off into the water and killed the fish. But the only way that the students found out that that happened is by doing the proper measurements over time and measuring the water. Just another example of a, of a virtual world that maybe you get the sense can do anything. It can be constructed for any purpose. In just a moment, we're going to see an atom. And we're going to see that conversion of the tree turning carbon dioxide into oxygen. Here it is. They have atom trackers. So these technologies, although we're seeing them, especially here with the fort and uh, the other projects I've shown you, we're showing you real things reconstructed virtually, but you can recreate things that are completely imaginary or invisible to the human eye as well. The students actually track these atoms over time to see how the CO2 is turned into oxygen. And they're the dead fish that they have to figure out how did this happen. All right. In this case, um, I'll go ahead and in just a moment we'll jump over and we'll just move on. Uh, this is a completely different immersive technology. We're out of virtual worlds at this point. Now we're into what are called learning games. This is a protein folding game. And what the students are doing is compacting proteins, and they're competing against each other. So for medicine, you need to efficiently fold proteins. For new medical discoveries, you have to fold proteins. Typically, it requires multi-million dollar labs and PhD level individuals to operate that equipment to fold protein. This game called Fold It went out on the internet. Students at high school level started to use it. 
And the art of folding proteins, it became clear that when you properly incentivize, high scores could do it. And they were doing it better in many cases. They were folding proteins more effectively than the professionals with multi-million dollar equipment. That was sort of staggering. Uh, here we have an algebra example, and I think what we'll do, just we'll show it for just a second, but it's the same idea of a learning game where the kids have to solve algebraic problems to play the video game and to compete. And they're having a competition here. We'll get just a second of the screen, and once we see the screen, I'll ask uh, to advance to the next video. Oh, yeah. Can you can advance if you don't mind. Oh, whew, thank you. <laughs> all right. This is what I call the inversion of immersion. You've seen all virtual, all virtual, all virtual. Well, that's fantastic. But we do know that holding and turning something around your hands has a special impact on your memory and on your, your nature, your ability to understand what it is that you're uh, learning about. What we see here are 3D printed objects. They came from virtual objects. They're printed one layer at a time with different materials, all the way up to titanium. Everything that you see here that looks like it's made out of plastic is made out of a certain type of printed plastic. But it gives the educator the power to print these objects that they're learning about virtually. And we can jump out of this one as well. So just wanted to give a taste. And finally, I think we're, yeah, here we go. If we can turn the audio up on that, this would be great. She's very quiet. <laughs> oh, I'll marry just a bit. It seems maybe we have a, a disconnect on the audio. Um, we had a couple of, of news stories come down to interview and show what was happening in the Hunter because we were using the video game Minecraft for education. Uh, and Megan, in just a moment, is going to tell you all about it. She led the project uh, in La Junta. They combined both the college students and the high school students with the fort uh, to recreate it virtually in Minecraft. And then, as I said, uh, two different clubs uh, from Australia and from Boston were involved in the final touch-ups. Um, what you're going to see when we get to La Junta is the Minecraft version. You'll also get an email that will give you links to view the virtual version, or portions of it at least, the early versions, on your virtual reality headsets. You need another beer? And with that, I think we're in a good position. Maybe I could turn it over to Megan, because she can tell you much more about how they ran this uh, club, how they reconstructed the fort, and then we can get on with the rest of the sessions tonight. So if Megan's here, I'll turn the mic on over to her. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, slide one. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so I've titled this project for the last two years. Um, I call this bringing the past to life. That's essentially what the students in Lahana uh, have been doing painstakingly. Um, and I'll give you some examples. So what we've been doing is um, you, uh, using blended learning along with technology with a hands-on approach. And the students were physically on site a couple of times to actually measure the fork. Our motivation is to keep history alive, teach younger generations, particularly in that area, about their own history in the county. Um, spontaneous learning and engagement. I'll give you an example. Spontaneous learning and engagement. So we were building the fort, and the kids go, hey, we want to put up the flag. And I said, all right, go ahead, put up the flag. So they're building a flag. Well, I start looking at it, and it's the flag that we see today. And I'm not a history teacher, I go, I don't think the flag looked like that in the 1840s. Hold on. 
Google search galore. Come to find out, there was about 20 different flags that we could find on the internet from the same time period. And I said, well, hold on, let me call Rick. Called Rick and he informed me that the flag was not um, standardized until 1912. So even I learned something spontaneous. And then we used a lot of multiple subjects like mathematics, engineering, and cultural diversity. Our program is structured. The students from Lahana High School come up to Otero Junior College in one of our computer labs, and we have Minecraft loaded on the machines. Some of that was a little difficult because some of our new club members had never played Minecraft before, and I'll be the first one to tell you I had no idea what Minecraft even was when I first started this. So for a couple of weeks, we let them all get on the same page, and we let them kind of get in the groove, and then after that, what we did is we put them off in sections, and then they were able to um, work together. Here's another clincher. They have prints of the fort, yes, but they don't have measurements, like accurate measurements. So we went out to the fort with blueprints, and those students had to physically measure every single room. Some walls of the fort are two feet thick, one and a half foot thick. So we were just, we spent a couple times out at the fort just trying to measure the dimensions of the fort. So they were having to reverse engineer it. And here's some video of that. Once we got that done and we were coming in, Aaron came down as a treat to them and brought down Google Cardboard, which was fabulous because nobody in our area had even seen that. And actually, you guys have that in your bags. So if you don't know what that is, you're going you're gonna to get a dose of it. Young and old in that room were astonished. I think we were in a Jurassic Park world getting traced by T-Rex. So during one of the breaks, come find me. I'll tell you which app that is. So here's a couple pictures of what the students have done. And here's the little camera action. So this is the main plaza of the fort, which you guys saw on the planetarium version, but this is the Minecraft version. And the students went around and measured, and we figured out that one fourth inch is equal to a foot on the blueprints, and we went to work. And for those of you coming down to Lahana, it's going to be an awe-inspiring moment. So this wouldn't be possible at all without the huge collaboration effort in between the National Park Service, IED, my college, and the high school. So where are we going with this? Yes, we did this in Minecraft, and I'll tell you what, I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm so glad we're done with that part. <laughs> When they asked me to do this, they were like, oh yeah, you're gonna do it in Minecraft. And I'm like, what is Minecraft, right? Well, I look at it, I'm like, this is something I played in like 89, the first Mario Brothers and worse, you know? It's like big Legos. So we're gonna move on to the structure sensors and I have, oops, and I have two students that are gonna demonstrate that for you guys. We're gonna go out there and do another rendition we want to do 360 degree pictures and videos, virtual reality, and ask um, access from all over the world. <coughs> and here's an example of that. The students, Rick threw up a picture earlier. This was the video of uh, the two high school students that I had, and they turned around and they gave a virtual tour of Ben's Fort, Clear in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, 
it was new to me because I, you have to really strain to hear, to understand somebody with that thick of an accent. But the kids were great. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right, thanks, Megan. Well, we're going to transition out now from the Ben's Four Project to show you some other um, uses of immersive technology. And uh, Oz Kachun to come on down. He can take it from here. Perhaps even Dan. Uh, Dan is available. Uh, but maybe I'll make a couple of comments super quick as we uh, do the transition. The Minecraft version of the fort was created, as Megan said, she looked at it and said, wow, it's really blocky and basic. But it was at that moment the world's most popular video game and our target audience was fourth grade students in Colorado. Primarily the fourth grade students because that is the required curriculum. They, they learn the fort. Now that that piece is done, as Megan mentioned, we're going on using much more sophisticated technology that gives you a, a more present sense. Um, speaking of presence, we're going to transition now, as I said, into more dome, and I'll ask Dan to lead us through the immersive sizzle reel, and then we'll move on with a couple of presentations and take a break. So, uh, thank you very much, Dan. If you take it from here, the MC for the next two nights. <laughs> 